So if you're watching at home and you have not seen the last episode and you really, really don't want to find out what happens in the last episode, don't watch the rest of the live stream. Just because I'm not gonna, I, if they want to talk about the last episode, I'm not going to stop them, even though they've been told by their boss not to talk about the last episode. I'm going to try really hard to stop. So first of all, thank you so much for an amazing season. Wow, it was really just it's great. the creators, um, all this stuff that actually happened in real life, like the stuff with Kadir, was that the name of the country, and the embassy, um, and Chuck trying to get ahead of the bad story, just like uh, Bezos did, uh, trying to get ahead of his bad story, the gun permit shenanigans, which we found out a certain family of note went through that. You wrote and filmed all that before it happened in real life? We truly did. <laughs> um, we were, you know, we're constantly trying to give these amazing people um, stuff to play that feels like it could really happen. And so we're always talking to people in that world and reading everything we can about what might happen. And the embassy thing, you know, we, um, we were aware of the sovereignty of embassies. We were aware of what the law can and can't do if somebody's in an embassy. And it seemed logical to us that that kind of thing could happen. But the tragedy of Khashoggi is, is, is just so beyond terrible that it so outweighs the sort of the coincidence thing. But we were, we did in fact write and shoot that before. And none of us had any idea that thing would happen with uh, Jeff Bezos until, and, and uh, only after when that happened we realized Unlike the Khashoggi thing, we realized, well, that's hilarious. <laughs> and, and wonderful that we were able to, to do it. So we just somehow are, all of us are somehow just tied into the way that people in this world think and act. The, the kinds of things that most of us wouldn't think to do, um, we've learned that they very well might. You want to add anything? Well, I think that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Paul and Damien, I understand that before you two have a scene with the other, you kind of have to psych yourselves up a bit to be in that scene with the other because you play off each other so much. What, what is it? That's what I was told anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> Paul, what is it about Damien that that? Look at look at the Yeah, my God, look at him. knew him a little bit before, anyway, so I, I, you know, I mean, we do, I suppose we do get psyched up. The scenes are very energizing that we have to do together, so they're already kind of like, we're already kind of up and ready to go. This season was a little bit different because we were pals, sort of, a little bit more, so it was actually nice. Speak for yourself. To have, oh, it was actually nice to have a little bit of a different dynamic, and, and but uh, we have a lot of fun. Yeah. Together, actually. Yeah. The scenes are fun, but I also enjoy being around him. Is there stuff that Paul does that, that you... There's, a, there's, a, there's an odd vocal warm-up that he does occasionally. He did the... <laughs> I love to do a my acting before. with... Flat. And action. Yes, I punctuate my acting with, with flatulence. We like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> it helps me know where I am in the scene <laughs> and where I am on set. So I do a lot of, like... Bobby, I'm coming after you. As I get up. <laughs> That's when I get up. 
And I remember, so I marked through the scene with Fletch. Yeah. We found your Emmy acceptance speech. You found my Emmy acceptance speech. Thank you. Cool. And, and, I, and I know when the scene is about to start. I just hear Paul coming along the corridor. And I actually find it very helpful. that question, but now I'm thinking we're all looking for that. <laughs> so, Maggie, Wendy th went through, uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, what, 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 I'm not supposed to show where I'm supposed to take the flashlight. Yeah, man, you open the door to the flashlight. A, lo a lot of fans come to us and they say, you know, how come you guys aren't getting the love from, from the Emmys? You know, what's going on? And, you know, I think we have our answer. <laughs> <laughs> Maggie, Wendy, it was a weird year for Wendy, uh, and uh, I honestly never thought I would see the character cry. Um, and I was wondering if you could tell us about the what you did as an actress uh, to, to to bring yourself to that point where she she does some very unusual things in this in this season, including I forget if it's the second to last episode or the last episode because I watched it the same day, but the big thing she does in front of the board. Um, Tell us just about that, what, what you had to uh, talk to yourself about uh, as the character, how, how she became the person crying. Well, we, we, talked, we talked before seasons, and um, what, one thing we talked about, one thing I was really interested in was seeing her, this person who's so controlled all the time, so in control and so in control of every, her environment and everybody around her and sort of manipulating and pulling the strings how interesting it would be to see her come undone, to see her come unraveled. And so we we kind of talked about that uh, collectively and creatively, and, um, and then <laughs> they, they dreamed up the path, um, you know, which uh, really started with, um, I would say, when when the Chuck Rhodes character sort of reveals their most intimate secrets in, in public. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I mean, to me, that's sort of the beginning of um, what what begins to unravel in her, and, and also precipitates a bunch of really bad decisions she makes, pretty emotional decisions she makes, where she allows, um, you know, revenge and retaliation and power to really sort of drive her and grab her in ways that we've seen her be more neutral around before. Um, so, you know, it's sort of begins in that sort of dark uh, shame, place of shame and feeling totally exposed that, that sort of starts to work away at her. Um, and uh, I don't know, you know, it's just when you're with a character for as long as you are and then the circumstances become as sort of dark and dire as there, it's not that, it's not that hard to sort of follow through to that, to that place that you're talking about, but it was interesting. But when you're, just to ask as a, as a fan as well, do you, were you crying, was Wendy crying because she had betrayed a patient because she had become a person that she wasn't, that she thought she wasn't, why? Like, what were you telling yourself were the reasons for her, for her tears, or is, it, or is it just everything? I think it was a deep betrayal. I mean, I think it's, 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 yes, it's a betrayal of a patient, it's a betrayal of somebody she actually has feelings for. Uh, it's a betrayal of her oath as a doctor. It's a betrayal of herself her highest self, you know, she, her job is to hold people to this standard of how do you become your highest self, how do you become your highest self, and, you know, she's this paragon of that for a long time, and she realizes that she's crossed this line that she can't really come, come back from, and I think that just pierces her at some point. In Asia, in a, a big year for you, a big year, a big year for Taylor, did, did, um, was it the relationship with your father, do you think, the, Defining relationship this season for Taylor, or or, um, or, or, or how, how do you see the season in terms of the, what was the most important relationship? Well, you know, working with Kevin Pollock was really incredible. It was really a joy to have him play Taylor's father. You know, um, going back to season two in a session that Taylor has with Wendy, it is revealed that. Taylor believes that, you know, their father had this idea and, you know, wasn't appreciated by their company and was ultimately fired and the idea was stolen by the company. Um, and I think Taylor has built uh, the majority of their own sense of who their father is, who their relationship with their father is, and therefore who they are around that story. And so when we find out in season four that that is not actually the case, 
I think um, it, there is yet another betrayal of, of trust and loyalty, which echoes the betrayal that happened with Axe in season three. And so I think Taylor is really forced to reckon with the fact that the story they've told themselves about not only their father and their relationship, but their own life and why they're doing what they're doing, what their motivations are, um, they're really forced to reckon with all of that. And so for me as an actor, it was just really fun to, to play all of those moments. While we're talking about fathers, I do want to take a second to talk about Jeffrey DeMond, uh, who plays Chuck Rhodes Sr. Uh, and, uh, yep. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and my understanding is that when you found out that he was going to be cast as your father, you were just like, he's my hero. He kind of was a hero of mine. Yeah, I mean, I'd seen him for years on stage in New York, and these guys found him, and they said, you know, but they were you know, going to bait and stuff. We found the perfect guy, Jeff DeMunn, and I, I couldn't, I had You said, you said this, who told you that I love him? Yeah, I was like, I <laughs> and we were like, nobody. Him. But I also, I mean, it's, it's a wonderful thing because I have this kind of sense of like, he's overpowering to me when I see him as my father, but as the actor too, I can't believe I'm standing there acting with him. Because I just, work. he's an amazing actor, and an amazing guy, and I've loved him for years. So it's a wonderful thing to have him be my father. And he seems so naturally like, naturally like some Amazing. CEO, <laughs> skull and bones man. Totally. <laughs> that, that you, but you tell me he like, he's like an artist who lives in the woods. Yeah, yeah. he's not, yeah. He's he's not allowed. Like, no, not for He's a, a lifelong theater actor and obviously movies and TV shows as well, but like a bohemian guy. Yeah, you know, at, at, oh, he's nothing like that. At Table Reads, you know, I'm like, Jeff, what's up? What, what are you doing? And he's like, oh, I just took the train in. I was felling trees in my yard. Yeah, it's always like, that was great. Yeah, I do think it's easy for people to watch the show and sort of think, well, that guy must just be like that guy. But he's, in fact, he's completely playing a character. Oh, totally. Oh, I'm Nothing just, like him. Nothing like him. I mean, as opposed to Damien, who's just, you know. <laughs> 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 I'm trying out, out, out the same old thing. <laughs> Series after series. Damien, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> let me let me ask you, when when you get into the mind of Bobby See you in the bar, <laughs> <laughs> When you get into the mind of Bobby Axerod, are you a good guy? Do you think you are a good guy? Do you think you're a hero when you're in that zone? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> there are two things an actor must know when they take on a role. Uh, one is that you must love your character. You must love your character unequivocally and without judgment. And know that every action that you take is the right action for you. But you must also know the story that you are telling. And there is a nexus where those two things cross and they meet. And that's the moment that is most interesting for you as an actor. So um, in a story like this, which is a story of shysters being shysters <laughs> to almost to a person, even we just heard from Maggie about how, you know, Wendy, that's one of the great falls of the show so far, um, what happened to her as she crossed the line through the second half of season four, uh, this season. Um, so everyone has been corrupted in this world. So, but it's, it's not a white and black world. It's a, it's a world of gray. It's a world of compromise, of obfuscation. It's a world of um, favor trading and people doing things for each other, scratching each other's back, mostly as long as there's something in it for themselves too. So, uh, Axe is capable of all these things. Is, is he a borderline criminal? Yes. Does he actually engage in criminal activity? Yes, on one or two occasions. Is he capable of great loyalty and friendship? Yes. Um, is he liked? No, he's not. He's feared. Um, and that's quite an interesting character to play. And actually there's a moment, and, and we spoke about this on the day, there's a moment when he arrives as a surprise in one episode, um, just before the hearing that Wendy's about to go through. And Maggie threw me this such delightful and genuine smile when she sees Axe on the balcony. And I was just left reflecting 
that no one had smiled at me like that <laughs> in four years. And that, I think, speaks a lot to who Bobby Axelrod is. Chuck Rhodes definitely thinks he's uh, a hero. He definitely thinks he's, he's... Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I think that, I don't know about that. I think he's a complicated guy. And he's, I think he's very aware of when he's doing something wrong at times. I think ultimately he thinks he's doing the right thing, but he's filled with a kind of self-awareness and self-loathing that makes him slightly different from some of the other people in some ways, I think. There's a kind of self-awareness to him that I like about him. And he doesn't necessarily love himself, so he recognizes sometimes that he's crossed lines in a way that's a little different feeling. You know, although he's a, you know he's a borderline sociopath, <laughs> you know, but he's got a kind of self-awareness that makes him interesting. I think at times that makes him you know aware sometimes that he's doing awful things and he's not terribly fond of himself sometimes. Whereas I don't know if this guy's ever not fond of himself. <laughs> and I don't mean that. I mean it's like I don't know that he you know I mean. Well, yes. Well, the bit of the story that we're not allowed to talk about yeah. right now. Is the first time that you see That's true. a real moral, ethical pressure on Axe as a result of an action he's just taken. When, you know, Oscar yes. Wilde says, you know, <laughs> I want to quote Oscar Wilde, and now I can't. And now I can't. <laughs> well, I was going to, but it's a little revealing, so. You'll just have to trust that I do know this, Oscar Wilde. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say it. <laughs> it's true of billions the whole way through. You kill, he said you kill the thing you love. Right, and, yeah. and that is true of all four seasons of billions. Yeah. It's even more true this season. Yeah. Well, some, something that we always talked about from the beginning, and we talked about it with these guys, is you know, in a character like Chuck Rhodes, somebody who's going to take power, somebody who's going to get elected or appointed to offices where he has great power, these characters will do things that are completely um, outside the law in order to get the reins of power because they have a surety that when they have it, they're going to do, do the right good. thing and it'll be yeah. for the greater good. Yeah. Um, along the way, it gets hard for them to remember exactly what that plan was, yeah. but there's just this deep belief that they'll get back to it. And then with someone like Axe, who's risen to this incredible wealth, stature, and power, the idea that these laws of men don't apply because they're just made by functionaries and you know, there's, no, there's no moral, divine right or power behind them. So these guys get to call their own shots. They've risen to that place. And these are the two forces that are coming up against each other. But it's a, it's a great compliment to, to, to you guys, you know, David and Brian, it, it, what is it that makes us watch these characters on TV, not only in Billions, but never more so than in Billions? You know, where we love people who are clearly immoral, immoral and unethical shits, you know, a lot of the time. And if the passion and the stakes and the need is great enough, we, we love them for that passion, for, that, for the striving for that goal. No, we love these four that, characters, but this is the four of you. Why we love them? No, <laughs> this, this is going back to four you guys. Of but, uh, and the rest of the cast. I will say that the two of us, in order to write the characters, and we've talked about this, we have to be able to understand the way in which they love themselves and how they see themselves. And we have to kind of love them, love fine things about the characters to love and, in order to write them. And, uh, but the truth of it, of it is, I think the best thing that we've all done together is cast the show. Because the, the magnificence of what all of you do, the humanity that you bring to it, the amount of thought that you bring to it. I mean, um, Maggie, you know, when you talk about that Wendy was going to become a bit undone, and so we talked about it, I mean, we had a lot of conversations about the psychology behind that. And the kind of kind that then you would go away and do this incredible amount of work to internalize it. And Asia, you know, what you had to do this season, we, we talked about it before the season started, we understood where it would go. The father relationship, you uh, got into you know, that great thing that happens when you've worked together for a long time, you're able to take bits of somebody's life you, and then turn it around and put it back for you in a different context. I mean, that's the gift of a long-running show with, with actors of this caliber. I think we love Bobby Axelrod, Damien, because 
you fucking play him. <laughs> I couldn't be the one to say that, but I wanted to. <laughs> There are a lot of obscure references that are made every episode of, of Billions um, that send us all to our laptops uh, or iPhones to Google. Um, and I'm wondering now if any of you have a particular favorite uh, that either you heard or you said or that you loved. We can, anybody want to volunteer first? It's a tough question. I should have warned you ahead of time, but I don't provide my questions. Mine, very quickly, because I'm British, was Judge DiGiulio sitting around watching a European soccer game. And I thought it was so unlikely to have a soccer match in the middle of billions, but I loved that. And they were, were they watching Bayern? Yeah, yeah was it from Milan? Bayern in Milan. He's Italian, so he likes Milan. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bayern Munich was close, it's in Germany. Yeah, yeah no, really. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I, the sports ones always blow me away because I don't know anything about sports. And, and as Brian's so wearing. your father the commissioner of Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> All right, Tappy, you did your research. <laughs> about it, but I see Brian wearing a pro bowling tour uh, shirt, and I did have a reference to some freaking pro bowler once in like the second season. I, 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 I was like, oh, really, Chuck Rhodes? about a pro bowling circuit? And in the middle of some really tense moment, I was like, it's like Ricky Sanders getting a tough <laughs> My favorite one. I can't remember who the guy was. What was his name? Do you remember? The Earl, Earl Anthony. Anthony. <laughs> <laughs> you did drop a Dick Button reference. I Dick Button, the skater. We yeah. Yeah. A triple <laughs> axel of some kind. Uh, yeah. Asia, Button. do you have a favorite? Uh, the first thing that comes to mind is there are a handful of Big Lebowski references um, this season in particular. It's a film I love, um, and I love that. I love that uh, last season Taylor got to make a Top Gun uh, reference, also a film that I love. There are a lot of synchronicities in the show that I love. Even working with Kevin Pollack, you know, A Few Good Men is a movie that I saw many, many, many times as a young person, and so getting to quote it to him and have him quote it back to me. <laughs> 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 I had to, I, I quoted Heat this year. Yeah. Yeah. That's my favorite of Maggie's. Which I have to say is a film that I, I don't think I told you this, but I, I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, it's so macho, it's so over the top. It's so like, I, it's, I know, exactly. But uh, the way I always think about it with Wendy is that this is her doing her homework. Cause she knows that the vocabulary of these guys is a very particular thing. And so she has schooled herself on certain certain films like The Good Busky and The Few Good Men and Heat and you know like yeah. gone down the list so that yeah. she knows. That's exactly talking. right. You know the way the way we go about it. We're in the writers' room with four or five or six other writers, and we assume that all these characters know everything we know plus whatever we can Google, and they have it at the tip of their fingers, and that they've all studied the other people in their lives so they have the right reference. Like, um, Taylor always knows the wrestling references that McVie's gonna make, because they just do the work in order to be conversant. And that was set up in the first season that Taylor's in, because Taylor gets McVie this gift, having researched it and learned about it, and you feel that Taylor's doing that, and um, yeah, it's just become a part of the lingua franca of the show. Do you have a favorite, Brian? Uh, you know, the, when to have Rob Morrow reference, the, the left side of the menu, the big Earl from Diner. Nice. And because you always think like two, when two people tweeted us that like that was just for them. <laughs> it, you really, I mean, it's just you feel good about it. But you know what, those references, I have to say, really are an embedded experience of who Brian and Dave are. And what they, you know, how their personalities bleed into this show because they are exquisitely curious and filled with knowledge and arcana and information and, and their, their appetite for knowledge of all kinds and all stripes is really, really huge. And so they, 
they bring the love of that to these these scripts and give them to all of us, which is nice because it makes us such a sweet way of saying a name. <laughs> David, do you have a favorite? Well, it was already mentioned. It was when uh, when Wendy quotes heat that acts. That is kind of weird. And, and this also uh, touches on the fact that the show has real comic moments in addition to, to high drama uh, and, and very emotional moments. Is that a challenge? Because some, sometimes you really have to turn on a dime in a scene. That's true, but I actually find it a joy. I mean, the humor to me is a huge, wonderful part of it. I mean, I, it, the fact that you can make this guy funny at all is actually really <laughs> terrific. And I love trying to find humor in the guy, too. Uh, the humor to me is essential to it. And, it's true, there's weird turns on a dime, but that's it's such a joy, actually, to do a lot of the time. I love the humor of it. It's very weird. Come on. <laughs> Axe isn't the funniest guy in the world, I have to say. No, he's, no, he's not. Um, no, he's not. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, Axe is, Axe is just busy being Axie. Uh, just, yeah, he's, he's, he, he's vengeful and dominant and... Um, he's a scrapper, and he's, you know, he's, he is some kind of embodiment of the American dream, the blue-collar guy who, who's an alley cat, and came up and used street smarts and got rich. And, you know, sometimes, I get the sense sometimes here in the U.S. that it doesn't matter how you get rich. Just the fact that you got rich makes you the man. And the axe is definitely the man in this. I don't know what to you to say that. <laughs> well, I that say it politely as a guest in your company. <laughs> um, you talk more positively about axe than anyone. <laughs> I mean, it's really interesting because. It, well, I'll give you two. This is an example. Axe is when, a I'm horrible here, when I'm here and I walk down the streets in New York, I walk down the streets in New York and people say, you go, Axe, you're the man! You're the man! Axe, the man! And then I walk down the street in London and I just get this little old lady coming and say, do you play Bobby Axelrod? You're such an asshole. <laughs> and that, that kind of sums up the, the different other world in the two countries. Jacob, you know these people in real life and you deal with them all the time. Power brokers, people who put their own interests ahead of the interest of the public good. And I'm not just talking about your boss. But the, 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 the thing of it is that um, Damien is a, Damien's character, Bobby Axelrod, is a folk hero to a lot of people in America. And uh, they love him. They don't just like him. They love Bobby Axelrod and they want to be Bobby Axelrod. And we are with you and with Damien. All of us are aligned in part of what we're so fascinated to explore, part of what David Nevins was interested in exploring with us when we first started this, was why, what Damien said is exactly right, why in our country have we decided that characteristics like verbal acuity, charisma, wealth, why do these things stand in for qualities of character? But they clearly do. So whether you think, and I think, you know, whether you think, hey, I think Axe is a bad guy, I'm telling you that these guys have uh, actually research on it. I mean, people love Bobby Axelrod. Now, we can all wonder why that is. We can all look to the White House and sort of try to understand, oh look, the Dahmer version is there. But, um, but we can look at all that and wonder why, but it is true that our country celebrates this. And I think that's um, a really fascinating question to continue to explore. And we are not gonna spoil the end, but the two of us can't wait to see how people are going to justify all of Axe's actions from here on to the next seasons of the show. Yeah, no, I, I think also just as a, as a viewer, one of the things that I tune in to see is, will Axe do the right thing? Yes. Or will he not do the right thing? Like, you know, that's one of the, you kind of root for him to do the right thing. But Can I ask you a question then? Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> the, the, the mythical framework of this uh, initially, and of course there, there are lots of more interesting characters now as it's evolved, uh, but initially it was sheriff and cowboy, right? Can we all agree on that as a sort of yes, yes. mythical framework yeah. for this? And bandit. Yeah, so, yeah. right. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, the story of Titan yeah, Apple, I've said that already. <laughs> so do we think, is it, is it true that the lawman, does the lawman retain 
the moral high ground given whatever happens or, or has he fallen as far as Acts? I, and, and that's a question really for everybody. Does Acts remain the bad guy that must be brought you know, to book? Mm. Or are they equally now fallen? I, you know, I, it's a I, I, don't, I don't know. Because you remain the government paid do, official. But I, yeah, but I, but I and the law law in a way is that, yeah, it's true. But, but I'm held to a higher standard that I rarely meet. <laughs> uh, it rarely meets the high standard we want to hold these guys to. Look, nobody likes these fucking guys at all. I mean, they know these guys are the worst. Who likes these guys? Nobody likes these guys. Yes. William Barr, nobody likes William Barr. <laughs> <laughs> nobody likes these guys. Nobody likes the fucking, the, the hall monitor guy who comes in. <laughs> Stop doing that. Stop stealing people's milk money and stuff like that. You know, I mean, that's what these guys are. We don't like these. Guys, who likes these guys? You should, you know, but seriously, but that goes with what you're saying already, which is that it's like we don't like the white Well, we put tremendous faith because I think he's a moralizing jerk in a lot of ways. We put tremendous faith in people in those positions. In Chuck Rhodes, in the world of the show, many people have put a yeah. lot of faith in, in Chuck Rhodes. I'll say that Alex Gibney directed an episode of this show. But, he made this wonderful documentary, Client and I, about Spitzer. And um, when you watch that, you see somebody who at various times, was absolutely on the side of right, had all the right reasons, and then, and I'm not just talking about the thing he did at the end, and then like the war he fought against Langone. Suddenly, something becomes personal. Suddenly, you can justify, yeah, like, yeah. you can justify, well, we're gonna try to listen in on this. And how, and what happens? And that's what's so amazing to us about what these people are able to do. You know, we can study this stuff and watch it and write about it, but the fact, is Paul that you're able to play these shades of Chuck Rhodes in a way that keeps us connected? To yeah, him. no, he's he may do dastardly things, but what we see is he's really somewhere inside and he's made a deal with himself that he's going to write this, and that is what keeps him from being associated. Yeah, yeah, and that is what keeps him on the on the side. Why we're still invested all these sure. years later. Sure, I think it's a question though. I think it's a it's a it's a phenomenon that goes along with the one that says why do we elevate these guys? Yeah. We've come to expect to be disappointed by these guys. Yeah. I mean, you no, know, it's like we know these guys are gonna they're full of crap or they're gonna screw up or I mean we're so cynical about these guys, and we probably should be. Because it's like, you know, I mean look at you know, they, they, they don't meet that standard. It's just interesting. I mean it's it's who the guy is, it's what's interesting about him, and it goes along with this question in an interesting way. We only have a couple minutes left, but I, I just want to acknowledge uh, Asia that this is a, a really groundbreaking role for a gender non-binary non individual uh, to be playing, and I know. Uh, <laughs> and I know that's not why you do it, and that's not why we enjoy it, but could you talk about that just for a second? If, if you put the, the, the position you've been put in because of this status? Sure. Um, well, thank you for saying that. Um, you know, I am, as far as we all know, the first non-binary identifying actor to play a non-binary identifying character on a show, and so I, I'm very proud of that, and I know when Brian and David created the character, they had assumed someone had already done it, or they certainly weren't doing it to, um, to try and inject some sort of like liberal moral representation into the show that would be um, a one-off or even the primary sentiment of what that character would offer. And that's the reason I wanted to play the character is this is a multi-dimensional person who um, is integral to the to the plot of the show. And um, that that's why I'm particularly proud to play the character of Taylor. And I think that it's been, um, incredibly gratifying and an unseen silver lining that the show has become sort of a teaching tool for people about gender identity. You know, people who say, I, I didn't know anything about this, and or even I was transphobic or homophobic, but I love the show and I love your character and I wish you the best. And that's, um, you know, incredibly gratifying. And as I said, yes, I am this first thing, but also, um, I, you know, I'm joining a, a trail that was blazed long before I was born, primarily by trans women and femmes and gender nonconforming people of color. This is the 50th anniversary of Stonewall this year, and so the, the character of Taylor and the visibility that I have would literally not be possible without the blood, sweat, and tears of so many people who came before me, and so I'm just honored and proud to be joining that legacy and to have a show like Billions be, be a part of that legacy as well.
That's all the time. I could really do this for another five hours, uh, but that's all the time we have. I just want to thank them for their generosity. Uh, <laughs> Thanks for your enthusiasm. I'm going to show up for such a long time.